plant lore, legends, and lyrics. Embracing the myths, traditions, superstitions, and folklore of the plant kingdom. By Richard Folcutt. 1884. Chapter 1. The World Trees of the Ancients. It is a proof of the solemnity with which, from the very earliest times, man has invested trees, and of the reverence with which he has ever regarded them, that they are found figuring prominently in the mythology of almost every nation, and despite the fact that in some instances these ancient myths reach us. After the lapse of ages, in distorted and grotesque forms, they would seem to be worthy of preservation, if only as curiosities in plant lore. In some cases the myth relates to a mystic cloud tree which supplies the gods with immortal fruit, in others to a tree which imparts to mankind wisdom and knowledge, in others to a tree which is the source and fountain of all life, and in others, again, to the actual descent of mankind from anthropological or parent trees. In one cosmogony, that of the Iranians, the first human pair are represented as having grown up as a single tree. The fingers or twigs of each one being folded over the other's ears, till the time came when, ripe for separation, they became two sentient beings, and were infused by Ormazd with distinct human souls. But besides these trees, which in some form or other benefit and populate the earth, there are to be found in ancient myths records of illimitable trees that existed in space whilst yet the elements of creation were chaotic, and whose branches overshadowed the universe. One of the mythical accounts of the creation of the world represents a vast cosmogonic tree rearing its enormous bulk from the midst of an ocean before the formation of the earth had taken place. And this conception, it may be remarked, is in consonance with a Vedic tradition that plants were created three ages before the gods. In India the idea of a primordial cosmogonic tree, vast as the world itself, and the generator thereof, is very prevalent, and in the Scandinavian prose Edda we find the skalds shadowing forth an all-pervading mundane ash, called Yggdrasil, beneath whose shade the gods assemble every day in council, and whose branches spread over the whole world, and even reach above heaven, whilst its roots penetrate to the infernal regions. This cloud tree of the Norsemen is thought to be a symbol of universal nature. According to the Edaic accounts, the ash Yggdrasil is the greatest and best of all trees. One of its stems springs from the central primordial abyss, from the subterranean source of matter, runs up through the earth, which it supports, and issuing out of the celestial mountain in the world center, called Asgard, spreads its branches over the entire universe. These widespread branches are the ethereal or celestial regions, their leaves, the clouds, their buds or fruits, the stars. For hearts run across the branches of the tree, and bite the buds, these are the four cardinal winds. Perched upon the top branches is an eagle, and between his eyes sits a hawk, the eagle symbolizes the air, the hawk the wind still ether. A squirrel runs up and down the ash, and seeks to cause strife between the eagle and Nidhogg, a monster, which is constantly gnawing the roots, the squirrel signifies hail and other atmospherical phenomena, Nidhogg and the serpents that gnaw the roots of the mundane tree are the volcanic agencies which are constantly seeking to destroy Earth's foundations. Another stem springs in the warm south over the ethereal Erdur fountain, where the gods sit in judgment. In this fountain swim two swans, the progenitors of all that species, these swans are, by Finn Magnusson, supposed to typify the sun and moon. Near this fountain dwell three maidens, who fix the lifetime of all men, and are called Norns, every day they draw water from the spring, and with it sprinkle the ash in order that its branches may not rot and wither away. This water is so holy, that everything placed in the spring becomes as white as the film within an eggshell. The dew that falls from the tree on the earth men call honey dew, and it is the food of the bees. The third stem of Yggdrasil takes its rise in the cold and cheerless regions of the north, the land of the frost giants. Over the source of the ocean, typified by a spring called Mimir's well, in which wisdom and wit lie hidden. Mimir, the owner of this spring, is full of wisdom because he drinks of its waters. One day Odin came and begged a draught of water from the well, which he obtained, but was obliged to leave one of his eyes as a pledge for it. This myth Finn Magnusson thinks signifies the descent of the sun every evening into the sea, to learn wisdom from Mimir during the night, the mead quaffed by Mimir every morning being the ruddy dawn. 
that, spreading over the sky, exhilarates all nature. The Hindu World Tree The Indian cosmogonic tree is the symbol of vegetation, of universal life, and of immortality. In the sacred Vedic writings it receives the special names of Ilpa, Kalpadruma, Kalpakataru, and Kalpavriksha, on the fruits of which latter tree the first men sustained and nourished life. In its quality of tree of paradise, it is called Parihada, and as the ambrosial tree, the tree yielding immortal food, it is known as Amrita and Soma. This mystic world tree of the Hindus, according to the Rigveda, is supernaturally the god Brahma himself, and all the gods are considered as branches of the divine parent stem, the elementary or fragmentary form of Brahma, the vast overspreading tree of the universe. In the Vedas this celestial tree is described as the Pipala, and is alluded to as being in turns visited by two beauteous birds, the one feeding itself on the fruit, typifying probably the moon or twilight, the other simply hovering, with scintillating plumage, and singing melodiously, typifying perhaps the sun or daybreak. Under the name of Ilpa, the Jamboa, or Rose Apple, the cosmogonic tree is described as growing in the midst of the lake era in Brahma's world, beyond the river that never grows old. From whence are procured the waters of eternal youth. Brahma imparts to it his own perfume, and from it obtains the sap of vitality. To its branches the dead cling and climb, in order that they may enter into the regions of immortality. As the Kalpadruma, Kalpakataru, and Kalpavriksha, the Indian sacred writings describe a cloud tree, which, by its shadows, produced day and night before the creation of sun and moon. This cosmogonic tree, which is of colossal proportions, grows in the midst of flowers and streamlets on a steep mountain. It fulfills all desires, imparts untold bliss, and, what in the eyes of Buddhists constitutes its chief sublimity, it gives knowledge and wisdom to humanity, in a word it combines within its mystic branches all riches and all knowledge. As the Soma, the world tree becomes in Indian mysticism a tree of paradise, at once the king of all trees and vegetation, and the god Soma to be adored. It furnishes the divine ambrosia or essence of immortality, concealed sometimes in the clouds, sometimes in the billows of the soft and silvery light that proceeds from the great Soma. The great Hindu, the moon. Hence this mystic tree, from the foliage of which drops the life-giving Soma, is sometimes characterized as the Hindu moon tree. Out of this cosmogonic tree the immortals shape the heaven and the earth. It is the tree of intelligence, and grows in the third heaven, over which it spreads its mighty branches, beneath it Yama and the Pitris dwell, and quaff the immortalizing Soma with the gods. At its foot grow plants of all healing virtue, incorporations of the Soma. Two birds sit on its top, one of which eats figs, whilst the other simply watches. Other birds press out the Soma juice from its branches. This ambrosial tree, besides dropping the precious Soma, bears fruit and seed of every kind known in the world. The World Tree of the Buddhists The sacred tree of Buddha is in the complex theology of his followers represented under different guises, it is cosmogonic, it imparts wisdom, it produces the divine ambrosia or food of immortality, it yields the refreshing and life-inspiring rain, and it affords an abiding place for the souls of the blessed. The supernatural and sacred tree of Buddha, the cloud tree, the tree of knowledge, the tree of wisdom, the ambrosia tree, is covered with divine flowers. It glows and sparkles with the brilliance of all manner of precious stones, the root, the trunk, the branches, and the leaves are formed of gems of the most glorious description. It grows in soil pure and delightfully even, to which the rich verdure of grass imparts the tints of a peacock's neck. It receives the homage of the gods, and the arm of Maya, the mother of Buddha, when she stretches it forth to grasp the bow which bends towards her, shines as the lightning illumines the sky. Beneath this sacred tree, the tree of knowledge, Buddha, at whose birth a flash of light pierced through all the world, sat down with the firm resolve not to rise until he had attained the knowledge which mocketh free. Then the tempter, Mara, advanced with his demoniacal forces, encircling the sacred tree, hosts of demons assailed Buddha with fiery darts, amid the whirl of hurricanes, darkness, and the downpour of floods of water, to drive him from the tree. Buddha, however, maintained his position unmoved, 
and at length the demons were compelled to fly. Buddha had conquered, and in defeating the tempter Mara, and obtaining possession of his tree of knowledge, he had also obtained possession of deliverance. Professor de Gubernatis, in explaining this myth, characterizes the tree as the cloud tree, in the clouds the heavenly flame is stored, and it is guarded by the dark demons. In the Vedic hymns, the powers of light and darkness fight their great battle for the clouds. And the ambrosia which they contain, this is the identical battle of Buddha with the hosts of Mara. In the cloud battle the ambrosia which is in the clouds is one, the enlightenment and deliverance which Buddha wins are also called an ambrosia, and the kingdom of knowledge is the land of immortality. There is a tradition current in Thibet that the tree of Buddha received the name of Terayana, that is to say, the way of safety, because it grew by the side of the river that separates the world from heaven. And that only by means of its overhanging branches could mankind pass from the earthly to the immortal bank. The material tree of Buddha is generally represented either under the form of the Asvatha, or of the Adumbra, which appeared at the birth of Buddha, but in addition to these guises, we find it also associated with the Asoka, the Palesa, the Banufala, and sometimes with the Palmyra palm. Under one of these trees the ascetic, Gautama Buddha, one momentous night, went through successively purer and purer stages of abstraction of consciousness. Until the sense of omniscient illumination came over him, and he attained to the knowledge of the sources of mortal suffering. That night which Buddha passed under the tree of knowledge on the banks of the river Naranjana, is the sacred night of the Buddhist world. There is a people tree at Buddha Gaya which is regarded as being this particular tree, it is very much decayed, and must have been frequently renewed, as the present tree is standing on a terrace at least 30 feet above the level of the surrounding country. The Iranian World Tree The world tree of the Iranians is the Halma, which is thought to be the same as the Geokarina of the Zendavesta. This Halma, the sacred vine of the Zoroastrians, produces the primal drink of immortality after which it is named. It is the first of all trees, planted in heaven by Ormazd, in the fountain of life, near another tree called the impassive, or inviolable, which bears the seeds of every kind of vegetable life. Both these trees are situated in a lake called Vurukasha, and are guarded by ten fish, who keep a ceaseless watch upon a lizard sent by the evil power, Araman, to destroy the sacred Halma. The inviolable tree is also known both as the eagle's and the owl's tree. Either one or the other of these birds, probably the eagle, sits perched on its top. The moment he rises from the tree, a thousand branches shoot forth, when he settles again he breaks a thousand branches, and causes their seed to fall. Another bird, that is his constant companion, picks up these seeds and carries them to where Tiztar draws water, which he then rains down upon the earth with the seeds it contains. These two trees, the Halma and the Eagles or Inviolable, would seem originally to have been one. The lizard sent by Araman to destroy the Halma is known to the Indians as a dragon. The spoiler of harvests and the ravisher of the Apas, or brides of the gods, Paris who navigate the celestial sea. The Assyrian Sacred Tree In intimate connection with the worship of Assur, the supreme deity of the Assyrians, the god who created himself, was the sacred tree, regarded by the Assyrian race as the personification of life and generation. This tree, which was considered coeval with Assur, the great first source, was adored in conjunction with the god, for sculptures have been found representing figures kneeling in adoration before it, and bearing mystic offerings to hang upon its boughs. In these sculptured effigies of the sacred tree the simplest form consists of a pair of ram's horns, surmounted by a capital composed of two pairs of ram's horns, separated by horizontal bands, above which is a scroll, and then a flower resembling the honeysuckle ornament of the Greeks. Sometimes this blossoms, and generally the stem also throws out a number of smaller blossoms, which are occasionally replaced by fir cones and pomegranates. In the most elaborately portrayed sacred trees there is, besides the stem and the blossoms, a network of branches, which forms a sort of arch, and surrounds the tree as it were with a frame. The Phoenicians, who were not idolaters, in the ordinary acceptation of the word, inasmuch as they did not worship images of their deities. 
and regarded the ever-burning fire on their altars as the sole emblem of the Supreme Being, paid adoration to this sacred tree, effigies of which were set up in front of the temples, and had sacrifices offered to them. This mystic tree was known to the Jews as Asherah. At festive seasons the Phoenicians adorned it with boughs, flowers, and ribbons, and regarded it as the central object of their worship. The mother tree of the Greeks, Romans, and Teutons. The Greeks appear to have cherished a tradition that the first race of men sprang from a cosmogonic ash. This cloud ash became personified in their myth as a daughter of Oceanos, named Melia, who married the river god Inachos, and gave birth to Foreneus, in whom the Peloponnesian legend recognized the firebringer and the first man. According to Hesychius, however, Foreneus was not the only mortal to whom the mother ash gave birth, for he tells us distinctly that the race of men was the fruit of the ash. Hesiod also repeats the same fable in a somewhat different guise, when he relates how Jove created the third or brazen race of men out of ash trees. Homer appears to have been acquainted with this tradition, for he makes Penelope say, when addressing Ulysses, Tell me thy family, from whence thou art, for thou art not sprung from the olden tree. Or from the rock. The ash was generally deemed by the Greeks an image of the clouds and the mother of men, the prevalent idea being that the Meliae, or nymphs of the ash, were a race of cloud goddesses, daughters of sea gods, whose domain was originally the cloud sea. But besides the ash, the Greeks would seem to have regarded the oak as a tree from which the human race had sprung, and to have called oak trees the first mothers. This belief was shared by the Romans. Thus Virgil speaks. Of nymphs and fauns, and savage men, who took, their birth from trunks of trees and stubborn oak, in another passage the great Latin poet, speaking of the Aeschylus, a species of oak, sacred to Jupiter, gives to it attributes which remind us in a very striking manner of Yggdrasil, the cloud tree of the Norsemen. Aeschylus in primis, quae quantum vortis ad oras, etherias, tantum radis in tartara tendit. George II, high as his topmost boughs to heaven ascend. So low his roots to hell's dominion tend. Dryden. In the Aeneid, Book 4. Speaking of the oak as Quercus, Virgil uses the same expression with regard to the roots of Jove's tree descending to the infernal regions. Juvenal, also, in his sixth satire, alluding to the beginning of the world, speaks of the human race as formed of clay or born of the opening oak, which thus becomes the mystical mother tree of mankind, and, like a mother, sustained her offspring with food she herself created. Thus Ovid tells us that the simple food of the primal race consisted largely of acorns dropping from the tree of Jove, and we read in Homer and Hesiod that the acorn was the common food of the Arcadians, the belief of the ancient Greeks and Romans that the progenitors of mankind were born of trees was also common to the Teutons. At the present day, in many parts of both North and South Germany, a hollow tree overhanging a pool is designated as the first abode of unborn infants, and little children are taught to believe that babies are fetched by the doctor from cavernous trees or ancient stumps. Frau Holda's tree is a common name in Germany for old decayed bowls, and she herself, the cloud goddess, is described in a Hessian legend as having in front the form of a beautiful woman, and behind that of a hollow tree with rugged bark. But besides Frau Holda's tree the ancient Germans knew a cosmogonic tree, assimilating to the Scandinavian Yggdrasil. The trunk of this Teutonic world tree was called Erminsel, a name implying the column of the universe, which supports everything. A Byzantine legend, which is current in Russia, tells of a vast world tree of iron, which in the beginning of all things spread its gigantic bulk throughout space. Its root is the power of God, its head sustains the three worlds, heaven, with the ocean of air, the earth, with its seas of water, and hell, with its sulfurous fumes and glowing flames. Rabbinic traditions make the mosaic tree of life, which stood in the center of the Garden of Eden, a vast world tree, resembling in many points the Scandinavian Ash Yggdrasil. A description of this world tree of the rabbins, however, does not appear in this present chapter, but rather later on in this work. Thus concludes Chapter 1 of Plant Lore, Legends and Lyrics. Coming next is Chapter 2 The Trees of Paradise and the Tree of Adam. If you like this video, consider subscribing, 
so that you can be notified when new selections are available.